Hello and welcome to Raw Live, where your opinion matters. Whether you're watching on Facebook, Raw TV, or listening to us on the podcast on iTunes, thank you so much for joining us. My name's Rudin Lee. I'm here, joined in the office by Daniel Jeffrey. Jeffers, excited to talk some footy? Always, always. And on the line, we've got one of the leading voices in Australian football. He's known as Mr. Soccer on Sky Sports Radio. You would have heard him on uh, the Big Sports Breakfast, seen him on Fox Sports, maybe SBS, um, or possibly the countless World Cups and European Championships that he's covered. He is, of course, Mr. Andy Pascalides. Andy, thanks for coming on. Yeah, it's great to be on, and rather ironically, uh, more recently, I've become the voice of the Indian Super League as well, which has been eye-opening in itself, uh, a competition that's just three years old. Oh, I can imagine. That's awesome. I'll have to get, talk a bit about that later. Um, today, maybe, guys... I, maybe I looked I look the part, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, boys, of course, it's the week of the A-League Grand Final, and because it's football in Australia, drama is never far behind. So we're going to be talking about the Allianz pitch fiasco, Uh, Video assistant referees, which have just come in, just in time for us to talk about it. And of course, previewing the A-League Grand Final and giving some predictions for how we think that's going to go. But you would think that, you know, Australian sporting... No, I was just going to say, don't panic about the pitch. Um, I've been working the phones today. I've spoken to a few of my Greek cousins and Italian (laughs) friends. Uh, They're all gardeners they'll be working overnight after the rugby it will be up to speed oh perfect that's a that's a hot tip i'm sure david gallop will be breathing a sigh you you, you know (laughs) look the thing the thing with the pitch guys is at the end of the day um we know that we're going to clash with other codes we know that our season finishes when the winter sports are well and truly on we know it's a lottery because we we can't determine where a grand final's played until literally the week before. So uh, it's a tough one, isn't it? Um, ideally, yeah, wouldn't it be great if there was no Super Rugby? Ideally, yes, wouldn't it be great if we could block that, that venue for the whole weekend? But um, I don't think it'll affect Sydney as much as it will affect Melbourne Victory because Sydney know what they've had to deal with at that ground all season. And let's not forget, there's only been four goal celebrations there all season. For the for the visiting team, from a from a rugby perspective, it was an opportunity for the Waratahs to kind of go to the suburbs um, and kind of you know have that um, small ground boutique atmosphere. Which have a full ground for once. Maybe. Well, maybe half full, but <laughs> um, you know I, I think it would have been great to see them go and play at North Sydney Oval. Um, partly because it would have um, garnered Australian rugby a bit of, a bit of goodwill when they. God knows they need it at the moment. <laughs> um, but also, as a football fan, you want to see uh, the game's showpiece event or the country's showpiece event played on the best field possible. Um, and had the Waratahs moved, there would have been a better chance of that. Absolutely. I think I never thought there was any chance of the Waratahs budging. Um, no. I imagine it's a, it's a logistical nightmare for them, and I mean, there's really no, no big incentive. But it is, it's a tragedy for Australian sport because... You know, we were at the Waratahs game uh, a few weeks ago against the Kings and that hardly anyone there. Atmosphere wasn't great. And to think that we're going to have a pitch torn up um, for the, you know, Australian football showpiece event of the year for that is, is upsetting. But if I was a, you know, if I was head of the Waratahs or whoever makes that decision, I would probably do the same, I think. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, Andy, do you think moving forward that there needs to be a change in the way that um, the grand final, the way that the A-League approaches the grand final? Um, yeah, look, is there an avenue to try and do something in midweek? Maybe, perhaps, to the corporates attend? Will it rate well on TV? Will teams appreciate that? Remembering that um, on Saturday there is a possibility, uh, a slight possibility at that of rain as well, so... Um, we've got overcast conditions today and we expect a few more days like that. So it's a real difficult one for our game. And, and um, we all know that we can't conclude our season before the uh, winter codes begin. And we're in that dilemma. There's only a handful of countries that suffer this dilemma. Um, you know, we wouldn't even be talking about it if we were covering any of the European leagues or South American leagues because all those stadiums are run by football clubs. And it's just uh, the nature of the beast in this country. Um, we, we, you know, we're, we're using these facilities considerably. And I just wonder, uh, you know, out of left field, if the Wanderers had qualified for a grand final against uh, Sydney FC, 
is um, ANZ Stadium booked on the weekend as well. So you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. There's there's no real way forward outside of perhaps looking at a midweek fixture, but I don't think that's feasible. Is it uh, one person Ben on the website suggested maybe having a flexible grand final date? Is that an option? Do you think, or is it just? I think the teams want to continue playing because it's sudden death football, the business end, and um, they really want to get playing. And, and, and as you know as well, for some teams, uh, not so much these two, but for some teams that had the uh, diversion of the Asian Champions League. So um, that would have been an, another another ominous situation for clubs uh, if they'd reached all the way through to the grand final. But it's a tough one, mate. It really is until we have our own football stadium that's the game stadium and we know that won't happen because it's just, you know, we don't have... ...the FFM powers at be, be a little more proactive in for this one because, I mean, we've known pretty much since uh, New Year... Sydney were in the box seat to win the Premier's plate of the A-League. So they were, have been raging hot favourites to host the grand final for quite some yeah. time now. And now I know it's, it was too late to block out that entire week and say so we have exclusive usage for Allianz Stadium. But would have been, I, I'm not sure if they've done anything like this. If they have, good on them for trying. But you would have loved to see them be really proactive, reach out to the Waratahs and say, hey, look there's a pretty good chance we're hosting this grand final at day X. If that happens, can we look at organising some kind of situation where you guys play at a different venue to try and make Allianz as playable well, as possible? How, how about this, guys? How about this? What if, in the perfect world, football had first crack at Allianz on the Saturday night and rugby played on the Sunday? Because we don't scuff up pitches like Union and League do. So their pitch would be in pretty good nick for the Sunday game if it was to happen. That sounds like a very simple, elegant solution <laughs> that I haven't heard at all. Oh, it, <laughs> it, it, it's certainly a good one. I mean, plus, Ben, you know, you give the uh, the winning side a whole Sunday off to celebrate before they have to exactly. go back to work. Well, there you go. We've solved it. Good work. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Hey, what happened to Mad Monday? We have to, might have to just bump it forward a bit. Yeah. Mad Sunday still <laughs> rhymes. You can do both. You can do no. both. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we might just end it, uh, this, this topic, uh, with a rare sympathetic comment from a rugby fan, Nikki T, who said, as a long-suffering Tars supporter, they should have moved aside uh, in sports. It's for the good of all things New South Wales. The Tars should have gone to North Sydney Oval. Let's face it, they're not going to get a crowd turning up or on the box anyway. So that's nice to hear from a rugby fan. But let's move on to the next topic, guys, um, of virtual assistant referees. Um, most other sports almost, you know, more than a decade ago have, have really moved quite quickly into this space of video review technology and soccer, I guess in its infinite quirks um, and idiosyncrasies have sort of pushed away from this. And now only as of last year really is when we saw the first, um, first use of it in an international friendly with France and Italy. And now all eyes are on the A-League because um, it's really the first professional league to implement it. And it only kicked off um, April 7, so a few rounds ago. Um, and it's a really big move for the sport, and I'm sure all eyes across the world will be on the A-League. Andy, what have your impressions been, um, I guess, just early early on with this new technology? It's been much needed. How many times have we seen uh, a lot of uh, controversial moments, at, not, not just at A-League level, but global, uh, international tournaments, World Cups, Euros... Uh, we're catching up with other sports, yes, and obviously the real test will come in Russia next year uh, in the World Cup. It's it's interesting the amount of um, media attention it did receive because there's obviously two controversial moments. I think uh, Shrebodilovsky, I think he got it right on both occasions. Uh, I don't think in the first one, uh, Bobo v. Djulbic, um, I don't think Djulbic would have got to the ball. Um, and the second one, um, you know, Holosko was ruled offside um, after heading home that uh, Neil Cross. And again, the linesman was overruled by Dolovsky. And that was, um, to me, it was a more straightforward call. So I think Strebo probably uh, ticked both boxes correctly. Um, but overall, I mean, Sydney did dominate that one, didn't they? Yeah, absolutely. 
Is yeah, I mean, uh, for me, I absolutely agree with Andy in that you can't really argue with the decisions that um, that we got on Saturday night. Um, you know, I, I don't think there can be much doubt about the first goal. Maybe Dribulic was um, impeded a little bit. Would he have got to the ball? I don't think so. And then the second goal with Holosko is undoubtedly on side. For me, the problem comes with the process. Um, and, yeah. And there wasn't... Watching the game live, it wasn't clear enough what on earth was going <laughs> on. I mean, kind of with, with the first goal, I think it was Jordy Boas who scored. It's kind of like, yes, he's scored. He's going to celebrate. Hang on, the, ref, the assistant referee's put his flag up. Oh, by the way, we're going to the, to the review. I forgot. <laughs> and the second one, again, it, it seems like uh, the review came in uh, it, and it took too long for that review to come in. I think we need to get it to the point where referees are using it within a couple of seconds of blowing the whistle. And um, it, if we get to that stage, I don't think we'll have too many complaints about it um, because as we saw on Sunday night, the outcome was ultimate, ultimately the correct one. It always struck me as a curious one why some teething problems, um, but I think we can all agree, good thing for the sport moving forward. Uh, look, down the track, I think we'll look back at it and say innovative, historic move. It's working well for the game because I think those line ball decisions on offsides and whether the, the whole ball has crossed the line, um, yeah, you can have three or four or five match officials on a pitch, but that video is so concise and let's hope it will be concise because I, I'd like to see a few more camera angles to make sure of those situations as well. Well, we've got the grand final we've wanted, really. We've got Sydney FC with their record-shattering season uh, against the old enemy Melbourne victory for them. Should be an absolute ripper of a game. Let's start. There's a lot of things to talk about, but let's start, Andy, with... Um, I guess, where, where's the game going to be won and lost on, on Sunday? Sorry, in the midfield? Yeah, yeah, you look at the formations and you look at the way they line up. And, and last week, obviously... Um, Sydney again. Look, Graham Arnold has been a model of consistency in terms of team selection. Ten of his team have played in 25 or more games. And you look at that bench, I mean, wow. Uh, Dimitrovic, Chibini, Carney, Simon. Uh, that's some serious uh, armoury to have in reserve. And they've got so many offensive looking players. And I just like the way defensively, in the first credit to them, so many clean sheets this year. And Berlanti and O'Neill have worked so well. Uh, in front of that back four. And, and what about offensively? Holosko, Brosk, the player of the year, Ninkovic, and an, another guy called Bobo up front who's banged in uh, 15 goals as well. So it's tremendous what they've achieved and they've done it with a minimum of fuss and, and, and real consistent. And it hasn't been a case... Uh, conversely, I like the way um, they shape up Melbourne victory. And when you've got Valeri, Troisi and Broxham in that midfield, gee, a lot of experience a lot of go forward, but again, a lot of grunt and grind as well. Uh, to me, the key will be um, Berisha, obviously. Uh, what impact Berisha has? Uh, can they starve victory of possession? Can they um, really keep close tabs on Berisha? Because we all know, you give him one inch, one chance, you know what will happen. And he loves finals football. They nullify Berisha. Um, they close out that midfield. And um, I think Sydney will win. And dare I say, they might actually win by a couple. Win by a couple. Jeffers, how about your impressions? For me, it, co I'm, it comes down to um, Sydney's midfield duo of Josh Brillante and O'Neill. Those guys have been dominating the games for Sydney so far. They might not be getting on the score sheet all that often, but that's not their job. Their job is to dictate the play, shut down a opposing attacks and they've done that exceedingly well and it helps when Josh Berlante is knocking in 30 yard goals every now and then um, <laughs> yeah as Andy says they shut down their victory uh, counterparts Sydney win this game I mean for me the point of difference though comes in the defense um, I mean Sydney I believe have the best defensive record in A-League history this year 17 clean sheets from 28 games that's a phenomenal record and if you compare the two sides' at attacking options, they're probably actually quite similar. If you're comparing um, Bobo, Ninkovic, uh, Brosk and Holosko to Berisha, Troisi, Ben Kalfala and Marco Rojas, but it's the defence. You know, do Victory have the guys to nullify 
uh, Sydney's attacking options in the same way that Sydney can nullify the victories? I don't think so. Uh, so for me, it's a Sydney win. Andy, if you're Melbourne, what are your main tactics to sort of take this incredibly unlikely win? It'll be very interesting because the Battle of the Benches is uh, eye-opening for me. You've got two guys that were former teammates. Um, one finished his soccer career well before the other, of course. But um, And they've stood up on the big stage very admirably. And my concern for Melbourne is the run home, the way Muscat's team has performed coming into the finals. Yeah, they got over the line last week. But you know what? Um, two wins in the closing six rounds of the season and only scoring five goals. Um, their only highlight in terms of away form in recent months has been winning at uh, Gosford 3-zip in mid-Feb. And that was their only win in their last seven away games. So what's the issue travelling at the moment for Melbourne victory? It's not like they've had a, a really demanding schedule. Um, what has been the factor that's worked against them? You know, um, Musket, for mine, um, fantastic what he's achieved. And he's and he sort of got redemption, didn't he, last time out for Melbourne after losing uh, an epic shootout, of course, after extra time against Sydney um, a few years back. But um, I just think Arnie's got the wood on him. Um, Melbourne's away form's pretty good when you look at what other teams have done this year. But five wins on the road compared to um, Sydney's home record, that's... You know, and don't forget the, the the fact that I don't know what the pre-sales are like, but that's going to work in in Sydney's favour, a home grand final. Um, and you know, this will, I think if they do it, it'll be the fourth time in a row the premiers have become champions. But correct me if I'm wrong. Sounds right to me. Yeah, I, think that's right. <laughs> I can't correct you. Um, yeah, apparently, well, the ticket sales apparently have been have been through the roof. It should be an absolute belter of a game. Um, I guess we're going to just have to wait and see and we'll have to come back next week and, and see, see how correct we were. But Andy, I'd like to talk to you for a little bit about um, your initiative, the heartbeat of football. We know just this weekend, tragically, uh, Robert Carpenter passed away on the field for Blackstone United, uh, their goalkeeper. And you've got an initiative um, to sort of try to save lives on the football pitch. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, well, um, this all sort of came about uh, a few years back, I just saw a little spike in heart attack deaths. And it wasn't just old boys. Um, we've lost players from the age of 15, 24 and 26. And last week, we fell farewell Jason Connolly, well credentialed state league and former NSL player with Wollongong, who had a heart attack after a game. He played over at Colo, which is Mark Schwartz's junior club. And, and Colo have a defib at their ground. But sadly, he had a heart attack at the wheel. Um, I'm trying to create that heart health awareness, telling people, you know what, go and get yourself checked. See what your blood pressure's like. Check your blood, uh, your cholesterol, your sugar, and all that. And even talking with Kiki Numov um, at an event last week, Kiki's one of our ambassadors, along with Tony Vidmo and Tim Kale. Now, Kiki's, you know, like others in this space that have had to retire, they live to tell the story. But what you will find is that genetically it could run in the family of players that are affected as well. So there's a lot there uh, in this space. Um, I'll continue forging ahead. We've got a wonderful team and we just want to make a difference uh, in football and in sport in general. What moves would you like to see, I guess, the, um, the games administrators take? You mentioned defibrillators. Is that something you'd like to see more of on, um, around the I, I Look, I just think... You know, every A-League game, Greg O'Rourke's a lovely guy. You know, he knows the space. He, he's had, he plays over 45s in the biggest junior association in the Southern Hemisphere in Sutherland. Um, he, one of the first things he did was he got defibs out to every A-League, W-League club and all the referees as well. Um, we see them. Job sites, airports, train stations, shopping centres, gyms. Um, they're, they're not that expensive. They should be at every sporting ground in the country. And they should be there for everyone, not just footballers, but coaches, officials, referees, parents. Um, it's a simple process in a sense when you look at it from the outside, but so much needs to be done. So it has to start from the top, from the governments, joining forces with all the sporting associations. And there's a few organisations like Heartbeat of Football that are, are pushing a drive for change. Ours is, we, we're not selling DFIBs by any means. We want awareness, we want education. We have medical screening, which we started last week at Sutherland. Um, and in the perfect world, 
um, the medical screening should be across the board at grassroots level as well. And anyone watching um, who's sort of inspired to get involved, how can they do so? I'll just jump online, you know, have a look at what our mission, our strategy, our plans are, uh, our Facebook page, uh, Heartbeat of Football website, you know. Um, and we've, we've already had six great events. We've got a big gala dinner uh, on June the 2nd here in Sydney. And uh, we, we just want to continue getting the word out there. And, and um, I think dialogue's big in this space. And minor heart attack after a game and got himself to hospital and was operated on. Um, so you, you're hearing some wonderful success stories. A, a couple of players in pre-season uh, had heart attacks at training but survived because defibrillators were at the grounds that they were training at. Awesome. Well, it's an incredible initiative, Andy, and I um, hope it gets the support it deserves. Thank you so much for coming on the show. We'd love to have you on again. Anytime, guys. Next time I'll come in the studio. Um, I've got cousins at work on Wednesday nights <laughs> driving cabs, so I'll get free lifts every day. <laughs> um, and also, guys, make sure um, anyone that's watching this, get onto the raw.com.au. You've got Andy's uh, first column for the Raw tomorrow, Jeffers. Going up on Thursday morning. Yeah. Beautiful. I think it's t tomorrow at some stage, guys. Yeah. Awesome. Jeffers, thank you so much for coming on. Pleasure as always. Good luck to Sydney FC and Melbourne Victory. Hope it's a cracker of a game. Hope the pitch is all right. Hope your cousins, Andy, aren't working too hard overnight on Saturday. <laughs> and we'll they see. Won't.